Welcome to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. Today, Ross Clark from ChartsAndMarkets.com runs down the major markets. He says the start to January might be a good sign, at least for a few months. He looks at the U.S. and Canadian dollars crude and why you could but probably won't get a break on the price of coffee. Publisher of Kaiser Watch on KaiserResearch.com, John Kaiser, digs deep into the junior mining space, especially precious metal operators. He gives us some tips on how to invest in the risky but sometimes very rewarding junior miner space. Ed Steer, founder of EdSteerGoldAndSilver.com, tells us why he's so optimistic about precious metals, especially silver, this year. We'll talk to Ross Clark right after this. Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. Recyclico's patented recycling process achieves up to 100% recovery of battery metals from lithium ion batteries for electric vehicles, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, and aluminum. Recyclico Battery Materials Incorporated trades on the TSX Venture AMY, on the OTCQB AMYZF, and Frankfurt ID4. For more information, visit Recyclicode.com or phone us at 778-574-4444. Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com, where you'll find insightful market commentary and timely technical analysis. You can find him on Twitter at Charts by Ross. Welcome back to the show, Ross. Good to be with you once again, Jim. Ross, how did uh, the stock markets look this week? Is it a promising start to the year? It is finally getting a little bit of steam here underneath it. Uh, and um, the, uh, as we mentioned last week, the you know, the, the strongest markets, the ones that have held up the best, um, have been uh, the big-name stocks like in the Dow, uh, the Dow correction into uh, December um, off the uh, the classic seasonal low there in October. I mean, it, it gave back maybe 25% of the gain, and now we're right back to retesting uh, the highs that we had um, in the, uh, in, the uh, in October. And actually, uh, retesting uh, the highs that we had uh, back in uh, the spring of last year. So the Dow is doing really well. The S and P's uh, sort of middle of the road. Um, it's uh, got some traction, and the Nasdaq, um, which was the one that really got decimated last year, uh, still having trouble coming off the bottom. Uh, and so the the leadership continues to be in the blue chip of the blue chips. And, uh, you know, we're, we're in that seasonal window, um, where you buy at the end of October and you look for strength into the end of April. And, uh, you, uh, you know, that, that happens maybe two thirds to three quarters of the years. And you really have to watch the first part of February or January to, uh, see, uh, if you're off to one of those good starts. And this, at this point, um, is starting to gain some momentum. And if we look at the individual stocks, that have strong characteristics historically uh, in the, uh, the first um, couple of months, most of those are really starting to lead the way at this point. So um, leadership is decent, and uh, I think that uh, the uh, investors should be just looking at um, maintaining stops um, just underneath the lows that we put in at the end of the year. Um, those look like pretty good support levels. And as a technician, I always want to say, uh, you know, if uh, if the trend is one direction and you think it might go the other, just uh, wait until you see the momentum change uh, you know, to uh, get you short. And if you're a long-term investor, use the uh, uh, any change in momentum that takes you through support to uh, look at lightening up positions. What's going on with the U.S. dollar and the Canuck buck? Uh, U.S. dollar, uh, has been sliding for the last week here, uh, managed to put in, uh, lower lows in the last couple of days, uh, taking out some pretty good support. We had, um, looked at the, the 104 as a support area with 108 as resistance. That 104 has been taken out. We're now, uh, sitting down, uh, in you know, just under 103. And this is testing the, the levels that we saw uh, for the highs in 2016 and in 2020. Now, of note, the um, 
uh, when we were up around the highs, we were getting all of our exhaustion signals, which indicate that uh, you know market was uh, overdone, and it wasn't just on the daily or weekly charts; these were on the monthlies. And so, as we were up at one fifteen, we knew that any change in momentum had the odds of bringing us back to uh, the twenty-month moving average, which is what we had seen historically going back all the way into the nineteen seventies. And as of uh, this week, we are within a hair of doing that. The moving average now sitting uh, just around 102 or 101 and a half. Uh, as I say, that's also a, uh, a test of the highs that we had uh, in the last uh, four or five years. So I uh, wouldn't be at all surprised to see uh, the dollar index find some support in here. But it need a, to close back above 104 to indicate that there's been a, a momentum change once again to the upside. And uh, if we look at uh, the other currencies, um, the Canadian dollar has just been biding its time. I had a decent uh, week, uh, 10 at uh, 74.62 at the end of the week. I'm uh, still looking at 75 as a pretty key resistance level. Um, there has been support as far as the oil market is concerned. And with the interest rate moves, uh, you know, the, uh, the U.S. been inflation dropping a hair on both sides of the equation. Uh, been enough to uh, put a bid into uh, the bond markets and uh, narrow some of the spreads on the interest rates so, uh, between Canada and the U.S. That's helped the Canadian dollar, but um, I think that uh, there's still some pretty good overhead resistance here. What's going on with crude? Uh, crude, it's uh, had a decent week, just like most items here. Uh, the uh, uh, as far as the uh, this action is concerned, we're up to the 50-day moving average uh, at $80. And that has been resistance uh, on probably, what have we got, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of the last rallies uh, since we peaked in uh, May. So um, this, is a, this is a key level right here. And uh, I think it will need to have a, a decent close through 80 to say that there's a, a bottom in place. Um, we do, we're into a seasonally favorable period. So, uh, if it does start to uh, gain a bit of momentum, uh, I think you could be uh, looking for a decent trade there. In the complex, um, that gas uh, has been under pressure, which is normal, and that would typically stay down well into February. However, the trade here to take a look at is uh, the uh, um, gasoline where uh, we're starting the beginning of the seasonally favorable period. And uh, that would, uh, that's coming off uh, what, what's the double bottom right now in terms of pricing. The uh, UGA uh, is the ETF uh, that the investors can take a look at. It's double bottomed uh, around uh, 50 and uh, starting to uh, show a little bit of signs of strength here. And uh, that one could be a, probably a buy and hold for a number of months that uh, has had uh, some pretty good years um, with uh, runs on the upside. So that's one to take advantage of. Ross, you're also saying we might want to pay attention to how much we're paying for coffee at our local supermarket or Timmy's. Yeah, I always, you know, I'm always interested when you see some of these big runs in commodities and they, uh, they get the headlines and, then uh, the public uh, sees uh, the, uh, the movement in prices in the store shelves. It's, uh, it's amazing how slow prices are to ease back down. The, the price of coffee uh, was up at $260 uh, a year ago, and uh, it is now down at 150 So I can't recall having seen some, any really good price declines as far as the coffee on the shelves is concerned. I guess if they're going to reduce the price, they just might make the packages a little bit smaller, which has been a very common practice uh, in the retail uh, business over the decades. So, yeah, I think uh, for all that I, uh, I think coffee's uh, prices are should ease at the store shelves. Uh, I'm not going to hold my breath. Ross, thank you so much for chatting with us. Nice to be with you, Jim. My guest has been Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com. Find him on Twitter at Charts by Ross. Coming up, John Kaiser, next on This Week in Money. 
Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. My guest is John Kaiser, publisher of Kaiser Watch on KaiserResearch.com. He's speaking to us from rain-drenched California. John, welcome to This Week in Money, and is it just like being back home in British Columbia? Yes, Jim, I'm happy to be on This Week in Money, and right now we're having a bit of a reprieve. Uh, more storms coming in. Uh, the worst in terms of intensity is over, but everything's so waterlogged that we're now cringing, waiting for uh, uh, the hills to start sliding on those houses beneath them. Uh, you'll be surfing down to the beach. Yes, riding the mud. <laughs> John, how are things at Kaiser Research and on Kaiser Watch, and how can people sign up for it? Well, Kaiser Watch, uh, we launched that in January last year uh, to replace Discovery Watch, and we managed to pull off 49 episodes last year, and we've already done the first one this year. Kaiser Research, uh, of course, uh, in terms of new members, had a had a rough year as uh, everybody lost their shirt uh, in general equity markets and then by the middle of the year they were losing their shirt in the resource juniors even though we had a pretty good beginning of the year so things have been subdued but we've settled down to a hardcore group of uh, 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 subscribers who are looking at the bottom fish collection and I've just launched the uh, the 2023 Kaiser Favorites, which are open to the public in general. It's twice the size of last year. And I'm very, very positive that there's going to be some fantastic winners in this collection. You're on your way to Vancouver later this month. What for and when? I'm heading for the Metals Investor Forum, which runs on January 27th and 28th. Uh, there's about 34, I believe there's 34 companies presenting at the Metals Investor Forum. It is free. It's uh, open to, uh, you have to register online. I have five companies in my session. Uh, we will be doing our presentations on Saturday the 28th. And then following that is the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference uh, running Sunday, Monday, the 29th and 30th. That has about 300 uh companies exhibiting and, and lots and lots of speakers talking about all kinds of things about how the world is going to unfold. I'm going to head over there to check out. Uh, there's several dozen companies that I'm that are part of my favorites or, uh, or or bottom fish collection. I plan to connect with the people there, see who's manning the booth, uh, and, and just uh, touch base with people. So it's going to be a very busy four days heading back uh, Monday evening to prepare for a Kaiser Watch episode uh, to, to describe what the mood was uh, uh, at the end of January. Can you tell us about your bottom fish list and how many companies you usually follow at any one time? Now, something to understand is that Kaiser Research is really a research platform, and it covers about 3,000 companies uh, involved in the resource sector listed on the ASX and also the Canadian stock exchanges. And the goal is to collect all this information and make it available through the online search engine that we have so that individuals, ones who are likely smarter than I am and more sophisticated in terms of understanding what makes these companies tick, they can track those stocks down just using their own filters. But I'm also a super user of this system, and I have my particular criteria for what I call bottom fish, which are companies that have some sort of missing piece that are sitting on the bottom and aren't really going to take off until that missing piece falls into place. And I highlight these for my paying members. The Kaiser favorites are, in essence, graduates from the bottom fish collection. If a bottom fish finally gets its act together and all the engines are cylinders are firing uh, and it starts to lift off and the, those members who have accumulated a position, they may be up 100, 200 percent, sometimes 300 percent. Then I say, okay, this is no longer a bottom fish. Let's put it onto the 
uh, um, KRO Favorites collection, which uh, is open to the public free. You can go to the home page and find the center. You can also find last year's center, where I'm going to still sort of cover the five companies that were not promoted to the 2023 collection. And uh, so, so the bottom fish, it's a, it's a special thing that I do for the paying members. Uh, Kaiser Research is not a pay-to-play uh, uh, service. It's uh, the only people paying anything are those who are members, and they're looking to use the research platform or follow my commentary on the uh, bottom fish collection. With so many companies trading at depressed market bottom prices, what are you looking for to call something a bottom fish worth accumulating? Yeah, I'm, the main th the thing I look for is a management team that I believe is working for the shareholders, not just themselves. There's countless companies out there where, you know, I look at the management and it's like, like, who are these people? What are they doing? What are their credentials? Uh, they go through the motions of auctioning properties and pretending to do something. These are, there's, there's a whole group of lifestyle companies out there. And these are the ones that really don't have any potential to deliver fundamental success. So I'm completely focused on the potential for fundamental success. Back in the 80s and 90s when I started, then I was looking for structure. I was looking for deals that were being set up for a promotion. I didn't really care what the promotion was or what the uh, end end output was. These days, that's called a pump and dump, and they happen suddenly, and you cannot predict them. So I'm not interested in covering these types of companies. I'm interested in finding ones that have a story that has the potential to deliver fundamental success. And these companies need to have decent financial condition. Now, there's several billion dollars owed by these juniors. And that's the beauty of the Kaiser Research Platform is I can uh, get all the, uh, I, I collect all the data from the financial statements that's in there. And you can screen if you want companies with at least half a million dollars working capital since the last financials, then you will only see those. So you don't have to waste your time sifting through companies that, that don't have any money. And one of the reasons I only have about 40 companies that I confirmed for 2023 as bottom fish is I didn't get the September 30th financials in done until uh, mid-December, so I haven't really had a chance to go through. Last year was a brutal year with, for, for raising money. Companies were still spending money, but they were not replenishing the treasury. So making sure that the companies that qualify as bottom fish have money in the treasury and don't need to do a uh, a hugely dilutionary financing, that's an important criterion. But it's the story that, the whatever it is that they're working on, um, what sort of theme does it fit into? Some of the companies have stories where the theme is a bit of a sleeper theme, that the metal may be in the doghouse for now, so nobody really cares about these companies. So the missing piece in cases like that is the, the, the metal price going up and attracting attention to it. But basically, it's the value creation story. What is it that they're trying to prove in terms of expiration? And that's why, to a large degree, uh, many of the companies uh, that qualify as bottom fish are expiration, discovery expiration oriented uh, juniors. What metals are your favorites and bottom fish focused on? I covered the end Entire spectrum. Uh, the, the, the juniors, uh, uh, they, they'll cover the base metals, they'll cover the critical metals, they'll cover the, the, the precious metals. And uh, I don't want to be just a, a gold bug focusing on gold juniors uh, or, or a copper bug or even a lithium bug. And, and, and I do think lithium is going to be a dominant theme in 2023 precisely because it's not about demonstrating the feasibility of some uh, a lithium deposit that they've been sitting on forever. It, it, it's all about exploring for entirely new pegmatite lithium deposits that have sufficient grade and size to be future development candidates. Uh, in, in terms, so, so the metals, I'm, I'm interested in all of them, but the, perhaps a, a variation of this question is, uh, what areas are you interested in? And I've realized that I'm very biased towards uh, Canada and the United States. I'm leery of Latin America because uh, 
Uh, there's a lot of resource nationalism starting to creep up. Uh, local stakeholders are becoming ever louder about complaining about a mine in their backyard. Uh, Brazil in, in, in South America, I'm still interested in. Mexico, I'm concerned about the direction that AMLO is taking thing. I was not impressed that he nationalized all the country's lithium potential last year. And of course, Central America, that's a disaster area. So Southeast Asia, I'm not particularly excited about. Australia, I think, is a great place to to, to focus for exploration and, and, and advanced project. And, and certain countries in Africa, such as Botswana, Namibia, and, uh, and, and, and Zimbabwe, I'm interested in. And Scandinavia, that's another area that, that I'm interested in. And in terms of uh, sort of the stage, I am most interested in discovery exploration because the S curve happens not with the, from the valley, the, 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 the value trough that comes when you're plotting through the various uh, PEA, pre, pre feasibility and feasibility study stages. Uh, there, the only action you get in the market is when the metal price suddenly lurches higher and drags up the implied uh, uh, economic value of the project. No, it's the early stage, the target testing, the discovery delineation, how big it's going to be. That's where the market's imagination can run wild. And heading into this year uh, with all the uncertainty about will we have a recession, how high will interest rates linger, will they torpedo the real estate market, uh, how subdued will the public come, will high interest rates attack ev attract everybody's money after a decade of having very low yielding interest rates. Uh, I'm interested in discovery stories because when they start to happen, they are standalone. Nobody cares about all the other macroeconomic backdrop. Are the big stock markets an important indicator for how the junior miners should be doing? You know, the last decade, the, the general equity markets were fantastic. And of course, the bond markets all reached a limit the, uh, when yields dropped. Uh, in some cases, they, they were negative. So everybody who owned bonds made a ton of money, but then they stopped making money on it. And if you bought new bonds, you were buying it at extremely low yield. But the whole quantitative easing cycle of the past decade, that really pumped up the general equity markets. And ultimately, it also pumped up real estate. So, so this was a very, very good period in general. But it was a bear market for the resource juniors. It, it was terrible. And and, and the, the risk capital went into crypto and cannabis stories, which had winner take all, all dynamics. Uh, uh, gold, uh, because inflation was very subdued, uh, gold, uh, kind of just lingered there. It was, uh, at a price where the, the real gain, the, 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 the it was not a significant real price increase, even though it had gone from sort of the 400, $500 level in the mid 2000s to as high as 2000, but settled back to 1200, $1300. I mean, $1,300 was the $400 gold in 1980 uh, uh, adjusted for inflation uh, to, to the present. And so there, there was no low-hanging fruit left. The costs had gone up in the period. So it was a rough time, rough time for the juniors. And heading into last year, you know, when we were, it was end of 2021, I had 150 bottom fish in my collection. And uh, I ex I expected the general equity markets to finally head into a downturn because the inflation wasn't going away. The supply chain problems weren't easing. China was trapped in a zero COVID problem. I didn't expect that Putin would invade, uh, invade Ukraine and disrupt uh, uh, things e even, even further. But uh, I expected the resource sector to buck the trend because one of the, the fallout of the bear market for the past decade is that uh, the producers stopped exploring aggressively, stopped developing new mines because they had oversupplied uh, the, the the demand growth that came with the China super cycle, and uh, and they got punished for it. And, and metal prices went went sideways because there was plenty of supply, and so there also wasn't much interest in the resource juniors. So even though the general market was great, it was a bear market. But I figured. With the uh, supply-demand imbalance changing as the economy con continues to grow, eventually demand will outrun the supply, and we will get a boom in the resource juniors. And in the energy transition, with its creation of new demands, you know, new usages uh, for, for say, copper, uh, 
you know, wiring all those future electric vehicles requiring a lot more uh, copper than your, your traditional internal combustion engine. I figured all of this would result in stronger metal prices. But the market decided to uh, project the consequences of a recession into the metals market. So by mid-year, the metal prices had sagged. Gold, which had a, actually managed to make a new high in early last year when the, when the Russian invasion happened, uh, it ended up retreating. And by mid-year, all the resource juniors were back in the dumpster. I think, you know, I am, I, I'm still positive, even though I expect the general equity markets to track sideways as we continue to digest the, the consequences of high interest rates. I think this year, though, the resource juniors and the resource sector in general will have an ability to do well as people project beyond the recession. And, you know, if, if the recession really turns into a disaster, they do have quantitative easing to go back to and uh, prime the pump and turn things around for the economy. Are times of high inflation and rising interest rates good for the junior miners? High inflation uh, is supposedly what makes uh, 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 gold go up. So it's kind of ironic uh, that it is the prospect of dropping inflation which has helped gold go up in the past uh, 60 days. Uh, it broke $1,900 on Thursday after the new CPI figures came out, which uh, showed a decline uh, year over year from 7.1% to 6.5%. Gold's supposed to go up when and when there are big inflation threats. Uh, and uh, and that was the big story in the past decade, because uh, but inflation was very subdued. Yes, it was eventually going to come, but gold languished. And it was only when the uh, massive quantitative easing took place in response to COVID that gold finally got got going again, breached 2000 and 2020, and has been hovering below that that ever since. But the problem with high inflation is that it tends to boost the capex and opex costs of uh, mining projects more than inflation itself, and these costs never go down. Once they go up, they seem to stay stay forever. And we have this uh, miserable situation now where the high interest rates are are sl slowing the economy, uh, promising a, a recession, which puts pressure on metal prices. So you have costs rising on the one hand, and you have the revenue side of the equation declining. And that's not very good for uh, for resource resource juniors at all. The ones that are doing exploration, uh, the, the higher cost implications, it increases the grade that you need for what counts as a discovery. And for those which are feasibility demonstration projects, uh, uh, now, now we're in this mode of, uh oh, the new PFS is coming. Oh, the first PEA is coming. Oh, the numbers, the costs are going to be way higher. And we're stuck using base case prices that reflect the, the 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 subdued prices from the past year. So, and, and of course, higher interest rates prompt people to put their money into interest yielding uh, instruments because they're finally getting uh, interest income, and and that that's not really helpful for uh, speculative markets like resource juniors, which uh, require risk capital. And given the overall uncertainty, what are they going to deliver a discovery, and what will uh, uh, the, the, what will be the optics of metal prices in, in the interim? That's not really a good thing for the the resource junior sector, and, and that's again why I really prefer to look at the individual story of a company to see if it can stand alone as something that attracts risk capital, regardless of this uh, macro over, over overdrop. Any thoughts on which metals could create a tailwind for junior miners in 2023? Now, the, the main base metals such as copper, nickel, and zinc, uh, the, in, 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 the, in a year where we're adjusting to uh, rising interest rates and the goal of subduing inflation from, like now, now, now it's at 6.5%, but to, to bring it back down to 2%, uh, uh, if the Federal Reserve is serious about that goal, uh, well, we're not going to see easing of interest rates any anytime soon. We may see the market start to project forward, and there are imbalances developing in a lot of these metals. I mean, the copper warehouse stocks are really, really low. And as I mentioned earlier, 
the, the, the producers have not been in a hurry to develop new deposits. And when they have tried to, they've encountered all sorts of permitting, permitting obstacles, such as, say, with the resolution underground deposit in, in Arizona. So we may see base metal prices trend up. Nickel's interesting. The warehouse LME warehouse stocks are, are extremely low, but that market has split into the nickel mat, nickel pig iron market in, in Southeast Asia, which bypasses the LME warehouses, which are fed with a nickel refined from smelted sulfide concentrates. So the, the LME nickel warehouse stocks are, are not a good indicator, but copper is a good is a good indicator. And copper, uh, we do have the EV rollout. Yes, we expect the EV and car sales in general to slow down as, as people lose their jobs in 2023 and, and as costs uh, continue to stay high. I mean, even though in, inflation is down to 6.5%, uh, that's, that's still a pretty pretty high, high, high level. Um, so I don't see the base metals doing anything. In the case of uh, lithium, we actually expect to see the lithium price come down as new supply gets mobilized from the lithium triangle and the, uh, the Australian pegmatites in 2023. Uh, that $30, $35 per pound number, and yeah, it looks really good, has very ex exponential appearance, uh, um, but I think it could settle back into the $10 to $15 uh, per pound range, and that would not be a tailwind, but I think the whole idea behind Lithium Mania 2.0 goes well beyond this uh, retreat. Ten, fifteen dollars a pound is still good. This is like uh, you know watching gold go to eight hundred and fifty dollars in nineteen eighty, and and then and then and then crying in your beer when it dropped back to four hundred dollars, which was still you know a thousand percent higher than where it started eight eight years ago, and and that w turned into a tremendous expiration period for the juniors. Uh, so I, I'm not sure any metal can really create a tailwind. Right now, gold, as it's developing an uptrend, uh, and and it's not so much worries about inflation as it grows bigger than the cost side, so you get greater total total profits as a result of gold tracking tracking inflation. But with gold, we have this, uh, you know, this, this, this geopolitical backdrop of uh, autocracy squaring off against democracies and uh, uh, put the desire to shift away from the U.S. dollar as the uh, you know global reserve currency and the currency in which uh, global transactions get settled. Uh, uh, nobody really wants any of the other currencies, uh, but uh, gold is kind of this asset class that stands alone. So central banks have started uh, uh, buying gold, uh, central banks from these autocracy countries, uh, uh, ra rather than U.S. debt instruments. Uh, uh, we may see that trend continue, and we may see uh, investor interest also uh, grow in the idea of gold as this hedge against uh, the uncertainty of a world whose power balance is changing. What's the latest on Lithium Mania 2.0? Well, as, as I mentioned, uh, the expectation is that uh, lithium carbonate prices will decline this year as new supply comes on stream. And the real question is, how low does it drop? Now, b back in 2015-17, when we had lithium mania 1.0, it was between $10 and $15 a pound lithium carbonate. Uh, but then the Australians mobilized all this uh, new pegmatite supply, source supply, and by 2018, it had tanked to below $3 a pound, where these pegmatite deposits don't really, don't really work. So we had this uh, lithium winter between 2018 and 2020, where the price was uh, not really, uh, uh, you know, conducive to developing any lithium deposits. But the surprising thing that emerged uh, in 2021 was that even though uh, uh, President Trump was uh, trying to promote a uh, fossil fuel combustion and, and, and lowering uh, 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 fuel efficiency standards. Uh, the car, car makers ignored him, basically saw the writing on the wall, and, and made a decision, a pivotal decision, to shift to electric vehicles. Now, it's still only you know, less than 15% of, of their fleet, but there are policy goals pushing for like 100% replacement of ICE car sales by, by 2035. 
And the car companies have invested now so much money that they are beyond the point of no return. So we will have this uh, periodic uh, back and forth where suddenly there is more supply of lithium than demand, such as we witnessed in 2018-20. Then suddenly that reverses. But I think we've gone through an inflection point where people understand that for this to become reality by 2035, we need a tenfold expansion. And the whole, uh, you know, you know, the, the first half of this, it's going to come from the brines in the lithium triangle, and it's going to come from the pegmatites in Australia, like they got going uh, in 2013-15 already on those pegmatites, and, and they will have a lot more to supply. But the real question is, where is the other half supposed to come from by 2030. And this is Lithium Mania 2.0. It's not, not about the, you know, lithium in general. It's about the idea of identifying this future supply that represents the second half of this tenfold expansion. And keep in mind, this assumes we will never have a solid state, uh, uh, uh lithium ion battery that allows lithium metal to substitute for the anode, which is currently made of graphite. Should this ever happen, then we will need a lot more. But assuming that 10 to $15 a pound is sort of the range you need to make all this new supply reality that allows these cars to be built, uh, we're talking about a future 100 to $200 billion market unfolding in, in, in a span of, uh, of, 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 of uh, 10 years, 10, 10, 12 years. Uh, nothing has ever expanded that much, but it's this necessity of this transition which is going to focus eyeballs. So Lithium Mania 2.0 is about looking for pegmatites in places beyond Australia, to look at Canada, to look at the United States, to look mm -hmm. at the Archean terrains in places like uh, uh, Brazil, uh, uh, parts of Africa, Scandinavia. And because it's about finding them near surface, drilling them, getting assays, figuring out the grade, the next two, three years are going to be extremely exciting. and I think people will learn not to care what the lithium carbonate price is doing. I think it's hopeless to get them to stop caring about the gold price and just accept that, you know, somewhere between $1,800 and $2,000 is just fine for discovery exploration. Lithium Mania 2.0 is about discovery exploration only and then pushing these into the uh, feasibility demonstration cycle by, by 2025 and having them ready to be built by 2030. So that's the, I think, Lithium Mania 2.0. It's alive and well, and I'm seeing more and more evidence of, of groups uh, uh, accepting this, and, and all the little fly-by-night juniors are all now staking land. You know, when, when a competent company stakes some pegmatite trend, then immediately the map stakers follow and, 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 and surround them with absolutely useless claims that they're going to flog when, when the Lithium Mania not because lithium prices are going to the moon, but because people are starting to understand. This is about finding another 500,000 tons per annum output beyond the 500,000 that needs to grow over the next seven years from the 100,000 ton base in 2021. Are geopolitics becoming a concern for the supply of battery metals for electric vehicles? You know, with regard to battery metals, um, Cobalt, with, which is used in the cathode, is the only metal because it's so, it supplies so concentrated uh, in, in Congo that has a geopolitical problem. But the key metals like, like lithium and nickel, they are spread out amongst a wide range of countries. Uh, uh, most of them are not autocracies, so they're not going to end up becoming part of this fragmented global economy where, where nobody trades with, uh, with, with, with Russia because they're, they're in the doghouse, uh, and therefore anything that Russia's a major supplier of is going to be, going to be a problem. Um, I think the, the, the question might be better rephrased. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, one other thing. Graphite. That, that may end up being a problem because China is a dominant producer of graphite. And, and China really, in terms of the geopolitics, uh, they they are a potential big problem because you know their their stated ambition to to make Taiwan one with China to, to have it stop being a democracy that ends up as an embarrassment for the Chinese autocracy uh, 
if that ever ends up uh, resulting in a serious blockade or even an invasion, that has serious problems for anything that comes from China. And with regard to, to battery metals, it's, it's more the concentration of refining and processing of battery metal inputs like lithium that's all based in China. But everybody's aware of this problem and, and, and refineries are being built outside of China so that these lithium that comes from Australia, from South America, eventually from Canada, uh, it, it's not going to go, going, going to go through China. But when you look at the broader question of the metals required by the electric vehicle, um, in the case of copper, well, you're going to need a lot more copper, but copper again comes from a wide range of countries. So geopolitically, that's not going to be a problem. But rare earths are going to be a significant problem because China continues to dominate. And although uh, back in 2009-10 when, uh, when rare earth mania 1.0 was running, total production was about 120,000 tons a year and uh, it was uh, coming mainly uh, from China. Now it's about 300,000 tons and it's expected, that is, is expected to double. But the problem is only 15 to 20 percent of that is of relevance to the uh, electric vehicles. And that's the four magnet rare earths, uh, uh, neodymium, praseodymium, uh, terbium, and dysprosium. So we, ha and, and they now represent typically 80 to 90 percent of the value of the, uh, you know, dozen or so rare earths that can be recovered from a rare earth deposit. So if rare earth supply ceases to come from China, that's going to be a problem. Now, companies like Hitachi claim to have created a ferrite motor, which is uh, as good as a, 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 a rare earth based magnet motor. Uh, it weighs 30 percent more, but uh, it's not like the motor is the entire weight of the car. So so that's not such a big deal. And that could end up making reliance on rare earths irrelevant. But as far as I can tell, this, this is still just a computer simulation. And we are many years away from uh, commercialization of a rare earth free motor that the electric vehicles will use. So I think rare earths are a important problem, geopolitical problem for the future of the electric vehicle sector in general. Not so much a problem, battery metals themselves. That's more a question of is there going to be enough supply to build those batteries that are supposed to fill all those cars that they hope to sell by 2035. Gold and silver seem to be moving higher. How are the junior miners responding? You know, I really hate it that every time gold starts to go up, it breathes life into the junior sector uh, as if this is like... Uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the holy grail for making money through exposure to a gold junior. And what I hate about it is that when then gold reaches its limit and sags back, it takes, sucks the air right back out of the junior sector. What we need for gold is a narrative that says gold will be trending higher in real prices. It's not just going to be this, uh, uh, you know, fiat currency, the basement uh, alternative, that doesn't really help the juniors because, you know, if, if the fiat currency is debased, uh, uh, well, well the, the costs of everything go up. It doesn't make a marginal deposit uh, profitable just because the gold price is reflecting the fiat currency debasement. And because we price everything in the fiat currency, uh, it, you know, it, it, it's really a dumb circular argument uh, uh, with regard to gold. But Coming up with an argument as to why gold can chug through $2,000 uh, and, and at 1536 right now is the inflation adjusted price of gold from $400 in 1980. Uh, and, and, and so currently around 18, 1900, it's uh, between 20 and 25 percent real gain. But that's not really enough after three decades of mining in response to uh, gold that had gone up 10 times in in, in, in price, uh, uh, they've doubled the above ground gold stock. All this gold is just sitting there doing nothing, unlike all the other metals. And this is what distinguishes gold from silver. Silver actually is in fabricated into something, doing something useful. 
That, of course, means you can recycle it and use it for something else. It's also a byproduct from other mines. So, uh, you know, the companies just produce and sell it for, for what it is. But if a, you know, macroeconomic or, or new usage demand comes for silver, silver has the potential to go up, go up in real prices. And that's not necessarily going to increase the supply of silver because it's mainly a byproduct and they're not going to change the throughput uh, of, of a major mine just to make to make more silver. So silver could get its own sustained uptrend, but it has nothing really to do with the whole sort of uh, alternative asset class. In the case of gold, we need a story that says it's going to trend higher, eventually be a $3,000 uh, metal, which would make a, the $12 trillion value of the above ground stock worth uh, $18, $18 trillion at $3,000 gold. But if, if, even if inflation, you know, plods along at the, you know, six, six percent or so, uh, again to that level, relatively rapidly and sustained, that would turn high hanging fruit into low hanging fruit. It would lower the grade that counts as a, as a discovery. And for existing ounce in the ground system, if the costs are rising less than the real price of gold, then you have an excuse to develop it and mobilize the new supply. Do people have different investing, speculating strategies when buying junior miners? You know, my own strategy is to accumulate unloved companies, the ones I call bottom fish, uh, that have some missing piece that I can identify and, and make some sort of calculation as to what the likelihood is that that missing piece will fall into place. And when this stock starts going up, I... Uh, just worry about my selling strategy and I know I'm always going to be wrong because I'm going to sell some too soon, some too late, and then at the end of the day, I have the additional aggravation of sending a capital gains tax to the government. So that's my strategy for the juniors and it is not the strategy of most people. The strategy for most people is to find something that's moving up jump into it, uh, ride it up, and, and, and sell it and go buy something else. And, and we had that happening in the second half of 2020 when gold charged through $2,000. And all of a sudden, you know, I was getting subscribers coming out of everywhere, and they were, they were clearly just momentum traders. Um, if you're going to play the junior game, you should focus on what I call fundamental outcome gambling, which is the idea is you, you look at the fundamental potential of a story and if they succeed in delivering it, what would it be worth? And you divide that by fully diluted number of shares and you get your future price target. And, and I'm looking for 5, 10, 50 baggers in this second but, sector, but I want to have a vision of what the company's trying to do that could actually deliver that. So, so my, my trading strategy is not to chase stuff going up. With regard to Lithium Mania 2.0, I think that will become a bubble where everything goes up and then somebody's going to pump it and it'll go higher and and uh, and, and people will play, trade that game. But right now I'm sort of looking at the entire universe, figuring out what's what. The Kaiser Research Platform, uh, you know, I selected some as bottom fish, some as favorites, but all of them are there for people to look at. and when we start seeing sort of a bubble take off, we'll have a lot of fun spotting those where suddenly the wind, there's a tailwind behind them, and that as soon as management starts actually showing a sign of life, the stock will take off. So so we'll have maybe fun with that, but my core strategy is to find these companies while they're unloved and be patient, and then when they start going up a uh, in a rare occasion when the story is really and unexpectedly good and I realize the market doesn't understand it, uh, then maybe I'll buy more. My subscribers may differ. They prefer me to take the risk and own the dog for years and then buy it when it starts to take off. Uh, that's also a legitimate strategy. But these are people who are watching these stocks. They understand what it is. They're just not willing to place the bet until it is clear the missing piece is in place and liftoff has begun. When buying junior miners, how important is the jockey and how important is the horse? I think they are equally important. Uh, uh, by jockey, of course, uh, you mean the quality 
of the management. And it has to do also with you know, not just one individual, but with a team of individual, because one individual cannot do all aspects. You, you need good geologists. You, good, you need people who understand the capital markets, uh, have the contacts, uh, have the credibility so that when they know they need to raise money, they can go to these parties. Uh, you, you need to have people who can execute your exploration program. And companies that are simply farming companies, these are lifestyle companies. All they know is how to package up a uh, you know, you know the graphics associated with the story pay off some uh, uh, pay to play uh, 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 service to, to broadcast the story, and then often you know they don't own much paper themselves. They blow off their paper into the uh, into the pump. Uh, you know they dump their stock into the pump. Uh, uh, those those types of people you can usually see them from their track record, the wheel spinning companies, the series of rollbacks that they have in their track record. Those kind I'm not interested, but it's the, the ones that have a team and that are working. That, and also, this is the important thing, that they have incentive stake. If they own hardly any paper, just a bunch of options and high salaries, then they are placeholders for behind-the-scenes people. Like we don't really know who the jockey is that's controlling the destiny of the company. So those companies, those are bad. So, so the jockey that's visible, that has a stake, that has organized a team, that is competent, that fulfills all the requirements for a successful junior. This is what I'm looking for. And often with bottom fish, they are missing components of this team. They may have a good toiling geologist, but they're missing somebody with market smarts or, or connections to access to capital. Uh, but the story is equally important because if a good jockey doesn't have a good story, they can blow as hard as they want. It's not the stock's not going to go anywhere. So I look for also good, interesting stories, some sort of geological hypothesis that they have about, you know, what are they doing differently to this uh, exploration play that was done before that can uh, uh, potentially show there's a lot more to it than was found before. Or are they in this grassroots region? What makes them think that there is a prize with size to be found in an area where nobody has ever really bothered to look for this this sort of prize. And this is where the whole lithium pegmatite hunt is interesting in that these large pegmatite bodies were found in the past, but they were worthless because the lithium market was worth 100 to 200 million a year for, for, for many decades and wasn't growing. So these things were found, but discarded because they just weren't worth anything. So now we have this potential 100, 200 billion dollar market evolving and everybody's scrambling to revisit this uh, these discards that were found as a byproduct of looking for VMS, base metal deposits, or, or gold deposits, and doing, doing a rethink. So looking for both the jockey and the story, uh, I'm, I'm tired of betting on just jockeys and waiting for them to get a story going. Uh, typically, the good jockeys start a vehicle from scratch. Uh, they position themselves and their backers uh, uh, privately, they come public, they open high, and so there's really no lucrative entrance for that uh, project. I do like it when they their company's been around for a while, they still have a meaningful stake, and one of their projects starts to develop a story that's interesting. And so that's the best bottom fish of all, where you've got a proven jockey who's in a down cycle at the moment, and the fundamental work they're doing on their projects is delivering something new and interesting, which the market is ignoring because this jockey hasn't done anything wonderful for a while. That's a, the perfect opportunity. But the, the management pieces that are missing, you know, if there's no geological competence, it's, it's, it's toast. If there is geological competence, the missing pieces, uh, the, you know, the promotion, the marketing and all that getting a higher profile, those are pieces that can be filled. So, somewhat deficient jockey in this regard with a decent emerging story, that's also a good type of bottom fish to, for me to chase after. Do you follow mining promoters that fairly consistently make money for shareholders? You know, nobody consistently makes money for shareholders. Some consistently make money for themselves. These are the pump and dump guys. And I don't particularly, they, they tend to be invisible behind the scenes. Uh, the, the serious companies, serious management groups 
which have a vis visible equity stake in the com company, they have no exit strategy until they deliver fundamental goods which result in a buyout of the company because they can't, you know, pay somebody to promote the stock or, and, and then sell their stock because they do have to file insider trading reports. Yes, all the invisible insiders, the, the string pullers behind the scenes, they can blow out their paper in, into, into the pump, uh, dump their position and then reload, reload later. Um, I, I would say, uh, uh, no, uh, I don't really, there are none that consistently make money, uh, where you can get on board on a, on a lucrative basis. Again, as I mentioned earlier, it's when these ones go in a slump and have a bit of a down period, possibly because the general market, the metal prices have turned weak. Yes, then it's interesting to check them out because you know they have the skill set to roll up their sleeves first when the general market sentiment turns positive. But we've just been through a rough 10-year bear market for the resource juniors. It's been a very difficult period. The ones that have had success, they've done it with individual stories that stand out that didn't really like wash over and have Me Too replication going all over. Um, it'll be nice to actually be in a market where even the, uh, uh where, where everybody, even those semi-retired can come back out of the woodwork and, uh, and, and deploy the skill set that they developed over the decades. What percentage of management groups running junior miners do you think actually care about shareholders? You know, that, that, that's a very subjective question. I wouldn't really have any, 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 uh, uh, answer, you know, meaningful answer to give to that. Uh, but again, the, uh, it, it's last year I had 150 companies, uh, tagged as bottom fish. Uh, right now I only have 40, but I'm going to be adding more this year as I, I get time to go through the financials and, and look at the, how these companies look after a pretty pretty brutal uh, 20, 2022. And, you know, there's there's a field of a couple thousand companies. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I would say, uh, you know, anywhere where you see management has skin in the game, they probably belong to the percentage that care about their shareholders because they're only going to make money for themselves if, they also make money for everybody else. Uh, I think there's a lot of fly-by-night uh, companies there. It's, it's like just, I shake my head at this endless flood of new listings on the CSE and the uh, and the TSX Venture Exchange with uh, stories that that just don't seem interesting. It's some old silver project in Mexico. Who cares? It's gone through how many iterations of 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 of, of, of expiration. Um, you know, and these ones, I really have suspicions that, uh, that they, that they really mm -hmm. care about the, uh, fundamentals. Uh, it's, it's the backers behind them who are the ones that don't care. And they get these, uh, management teams to, you know, do all the hard lifting and that. Management doesn't really make much money beyond their salaries, but it's the hidden people behind the scenes who take the money and run and leave the ordinary shareholder hanging. Is the way junior miners are promoted, marketed, and advertised constantly changing? It doesn't constantly change, though what's effective does go through cycles. Uh, when you go back to the 1980s, uh, what did you have? You had brokers making their money through trading commissions, and you had no information available for anything. And the companies themselves would run their... Uh, in-house uh, boiler rooms or sometimes third-party boiler rooms. They would literally call up, cold call people and pitch them on some stock and they would play a statistics game and catch somebody who would come into the market and buy the story. And it relied on a rumor mill type of story where it was not so much about the fundamentals. It was about, you know, incoming buying that was going to change the upside. And you had this crazy system of front-running and, and that began to change in the 1990s. In the 1990s, you went beyond just discovery exploration, which is what the juniors were all about. Yeah, you, you, you went into these third world frontiers after the Soviet Union collapsed and a lot of these autocratic com countries suddenly opened up and became available for exploration by, uh, 
by junior. So that ended up attracting institutional backing. That was also the decade during which uh, the brokers uh, started. The broker system was deregulated. Discount brokers uh, showed up. And it was also the age when newsletter writers emerged as independent uh, uh, analysts, uh, you know, like Bob Bishop's gold mining stock report, and then later on, uh, you know, the Kaiser bottom fishing report. We were no longer working for the brokerage uh, brokerage sector, um, and we were making our money not from being paid by the companies or bribed in some way, but we were making our money from the fees that subscribers were were paying, and these were subscribers who we're no longer with full service brokers because the full service brokers were shifting to high net worth clients. This was a period and this also extended into the 2000s where private placements became a major source of commission because you were making from 8 to 15 percent commissions on these financings. You could only do them with accredited investors, the, 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 the millionaires and the, uh, the, 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 the smaller investors, the retail investors, they just weren't worth the bother. And, with the emergence of the internet and, and the social media, original there was Silicon Investor, then Stockhouse, and now CEO.ca in Australia, Hot, Hot Copper, the, the retail investor also became empowered to have a voice that could be heard by everybody. Now, the problem was that, the, that it was all anonymous, so, so there was no real credibility behind it. But the 1990s into the 2000s, uh, the, 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 the the, the newsletters that made their money from their subscribers, they became an important network hub. So the companies focused their attention on trying to get these newsletter writers to like the company and write it up, and then they would rebroadcast it. And, and that resulted in sort of a circular thing that, well, as people heard about the, the Kaiser Bottom Fishing Report, that they would end up subscribing, and, and that fed fed everything. And but but in the 2010s, all of this changed. The the, the fee-based newsletter writer basically faded. Uh, the social media world had expanded substantially beyond a few stock forums, and you had a new kind of marketing system called the free newsletter, the sponsored newsletter, where where they could attract thousands, tens of thousands of people on their email list or with a Twitter following. And, and they, these, these people would, they weren't being paid by their audience. They were being paid by the companies to like the story. And that has become a major sort of force in the market. And you see some companies with huge line items for marketing expenses, like million dollars for, for one year. And, and they only put a million dollars into the ground. Well, well, they were spending it on all these, uh, pay to play services. And that has, marginalized the role of uh, um, newsletters such as mine because nobody wants to pay for the uh, you know longer term in advice or ideas of uh, independent newsletter writer who can only cover so many stories and you can't I can't really know everything about all 2000 companies out there it's going to end up boiling down to maybe maybe a hundred that I that I know reasonably well and of course the public became less interested in fundamental outcome gambling but more interested in momentum trading. And the momentum trading, uh, the, the, you, know, you know, Bitcoin and that, that's all just momentum trend trend gambling. There's no fundamental outcome, no fundamental story, except uh, people like Kathy Wood braying about future million-dollar price uh, as if there's going to be a bunch of suckers there to convert your, 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 your $20,000 Bitcoin into a million-dollar Bitcoin and give you real money so you can buy real things, and they're hung with this thing, which is really an energy liability, unlike gold, which is which is stored energy. So I think right now with the slump, the pay-to-play services have changed. I think uh, the future is one where the companies really need to focus on presenting their story, be better in articulating it, and then making it available to broad audiences. It, 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 it shocks me how many companies don't have a Twitter account. I mean, it's a free way where you don't have to do double opt-in for emailing, yet people follow you, uh, you use your Twitter landing page to direct people back to your to your homepage, which you have a good, have all your projects there. I see a lot of these garbage websites. You can always tell a pump and dump lifestyle fake junior because the entire website is one big page of flashing stuff. It's hard to find anything. It, it's really just razzle-dazzle. It's not a serious company 
trying to inform people who are making longer term bets on the fundamental outcome of the company. And the beauty now is we, as the whole social media world matures, you have this, all these retail investors becoming influencers. And I think this new, um, uh, uh, listed, uh, uh, exemption, uh, the financing, uh, uh, listing issuer, li listed issuer financing exemption, this life, which allows an ordinary person who's not a millionaire to participate in a private placement. I think, you know, although it'll be slow getting started, I think it will expand the audience out there, the retail audience that's interested in this sector, is willing to uh, bet on the longer term outcome. And these are all potential influencers within their own social media networks. So I think in future, if the company articulates its story properly, and it's one that starts to resonate, for example, like I think Lithium Mania 2.0 is a no-brainer to end up resonating with a very large audience, especially the younger generation audiences who actually want the uh, energy transition to become a reality so that they have a longer-term future. I think this will make the whole sort of marketing much more organic and viral than it has been in the past decade when it was really these high-powered network hubs of free free information being pumped at the audiences against the backdrop of a general rising tide that creates the momentum of you know capital coming in and out and it's always the late comers we hear about at last who end up stuck with the stock at a high price which then falls after the pump is over. John, how can people subscribe to follow your bottom fish candidates? Yeah, just go to the homepage, kaiserresearch.com. If you've never been a member, uh, uh, sub, sub, uh, click the new registration. It's 450 a year right now for a individual membership. And if you've been a, a, a member if you, in the past, uh, you just uh, log in. And uh, if you your email has changed or you don't remember it, uh, uh, then you will just have to create a new a new registration and subscribe that way. John, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money. You're welcome, Jim. My guest has been John Kaiser, publisher of Kaiser Watch on kaiserresearch.com. He was speaking to us from California. Coming up, Ed Steer, next on This Week in Money. Recyclical, making lithium ion last forever. Recyclico's patented recycling process achieves up to 100% recovery of battery metals from lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, and aluminum. Recyclico Battery Materials Incorporated trades on the TSX Venture AMY, on the OTCQB AMYZF, and Frankfurt ID4. For more information, visit Recyclicode.com or phone us at 778-574-4444. Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. My guest is Ed Steer, founder of Ed Steer's Gold and Silver Digest online at EdSteerGoldSilver.com. He's also director of GATA, the Gold Antitrust Action Committee. He's speaking to us from Merritt, British Columbia. Ed, welcome back to This Week in Money, and happy Orthodox New Year. Well, thank you for having me on, uh, Jim, and um, greetings to you and to all your listeners. Ed, what's the latest on the commitment of traders' numbers that came out on Friday? Yeah, well, they just came out about an hour and change ago, and they were they were very, very positive. Uh, they were much better than uh, either silver analyst Ted Butler and myself were expecting. Uh, what we've seen over the last two or three months is a great reluctance on the part of the largest eight short traders, and the eight the eight big short traders are all bullion banks, investment houses, or hedge funds. And they've been short this market for the last 40 or 50 years. And we've seen a great, great reluctance for them to add to their short positions because uh, they control more than 50, these eight traders, which all, and they all trade in unison, uh, control more than 50% of the COMEX futures market in all four precious metals. And they've been very, very reluctant to add to their short positions in gold and silver, particularly silver. And what we saw in the report today was extremely positive, and it's you know the from a COT perspective, you know it's you know it's we're ready to blast blast higher anytime, 
No, it was an excellent report all the way around. Are there specific market indicators you're following in this report? Yeah, uh, you know, the, the big one is silver, of course. You know, you know, anybody in the pressure who's following precious metals knows perfectly well that uh, there's a real shortage of physical silver in the market, and uh, that's the thing that. Um, you know, I look at most, what are the big eight short traders doing, the bullion banks doing, and uh, they, like I said, they've been very reluctant to add to their short positions. Uh, the, the physical silver market right now is, is so short of metal, uh, especially 1,000-ounce good delivery bars. It's um, That's the main thing. You know, gold is the same. I mean, there's there's not a lot of gold out there. I mean, the central banks of the world have been buying gold hand over fist. And China came out and reported buying, what, 30 tons in November and 30 tons in December, plus they bought a 300 tons big surprise in, uh, in the third quarter of this year. So, I mean, there's a, there's a bank run going on in gold right now. So, you know, I'm looking at gold very carefully, but silver is where the real price explosion is going to happen when it, when it does occur. And that's what I spend most of my time looking at in this report. Uh, I guess you pretty well said it, but uh, what metals are you focused on at the moment? It's it's silver. Silver is by far the has the largest short position of any any Comex traded product uh, by a wide wide margin. Uh, it's been that way for like I said for fifty years, and, and platinum is right behind them on the uh, on a short position. So the big eight traders are massively short silver, massively short platinum. And short gold, pretty good too. So, um, but silver, you know, I've been urging people for years buy as much physical silver as you can afford. Load up on the silver miners, and um, the day is coming. Everything looks normal on the surface, but I can tell you, underneath the, the deficit is uh, creeping up, and it's going to bite the market sooner or later. Is the Russia-Ukraine conflict or the possibility of a China-Taiwan conflict having an effect on metal supplies and prices? No, it's had absolutely no effect whatsoever. It may have popped, I think, when Russia first crossed the border into Ukraine, and we had a little bit of a pop there. But, you know, the, like I said before, the price of the precious metals, all of them, precious metals plus some other commodities, are controlled by these eight large traders, which are all bullion banks. And it doesn't matter what what's going on anywhere in the world, or what you know, re, you, conflict or otherwise, the price is set in the COMEX futures market by these eight traders. And if they don't want the price to go up, it's not going to go up. And it doesn't matter what's going on in Russia or Ukraine or China or Taiwan right now. Um, all that matters is the big eight short position. Do gold and silver seem to be mainly reacting to the U.S. dollar? Um. Well, if you look at the chart, um, and I, I look at it every day, you know, the correlation is there, uh, and it's pretty strong. However, I'll point out here that the correlation is only made to look strong. Uh, the, the Lord, the, these large eight traders, you know, uh, when the dollar is going up, they'll smash the precious metal, so when it's going down, they'll allow the precious metal prices to rise, so it looks like it's following the dollar. And the charts say it's following the dollar, but uh, basically it's the big eight shorts hiding behind the dollar index and the influence of the gold and silver prices to make sure they do follow the index. You know, like I said, if these eight large traders weren't there, it wouldn't matter about Taiwan or Ukraine or the dollar index or the price of tea in China. Prices would be rising. So, you know, what when you're looking at the U.S. dollar versus the precious metals prices, you're looking at a false signal there as well. Do gold, silver, and other metals usually move higher during times of significant inflation? Oh, sure, absolutely. That's what they're supposed to do. But mm -hmm. like I said, I mean, I'm going to sound like a broken record. The answer is the same as the other two questions. It doesn't matter. Look, we've had what? Roaring inflation now for what? Nine, ten months, a year? Um, and, uh, you know, the the official numbers of five, six, seven, eight, nine, whatever the heck it is. And it's made no difference in precious metal prices whatsoever. And the, you know, cause, you know, what silver was down all year and it finished what? Up one or two percent for 2022. And gold actually finished down on the year by about a percent or so. So if you're saying, does inflation make a difference? Uh, it doesn't make any difference in the gold price because those eight large traders uh, say it's not going to happen. And, um, if they weren't there, I can tell you it would make a huge difference. 
uh, and it should make in in the real world it should make a huge difference. And we're still going to see gold and silver prices met far higher than they are now once these traders decide to let the price go. So um, will gold and silver move higher? Yes, but only if the eight traders allow it. Where are we in the seasonalities for the various metals? Well, I'll tell you what, you know, this seasonality thing has been around for, what, 25 years? You know, I, I started in the precious metals industry back way back in about 1997, I guess. And there was a chart that, you know, was trotted out every year saying that, you know, it was selling May and go away and that um, there was a low in such, you know, a certain time of year because based on China or whatever the heck it was. And you could see it there on the chart however it's like everything else i mean we have eight large traders all of them bullion banks influencing the price you know there's a seasonality to it because they make a seasonality to it uh china which was nowhere to be seen in the precious metals market 25 years ago is now the largest player in it and india's right behind them so you know is there a seasonality only if they make it so, uh, and frankly, it's kind of gone out of the window in the last 10 years, in my opinion. How are the junior mid-cap and senior metal stocks looking? Well, you know, let's lump them all into one. Uh, they are, since the lows back, when the heck were the lows in the precious metal? November, something like that? I mean, uh, silver equities are up 30 or 40 percent, and the gold equities are up the same amount. I mean, we've seen the lows for the precious metals for this particular move down back then, and so we're climbing out of a deep hole. So, you know, in the last, you know, two or three months, the stocks have done fantastically well, and they've also done very well uh, so far this year, although there's, a, you know, in the last, this last week, there hasn't been a lot of price movement in the uh, precious metal stocks, but the trend is definitely up. And I don't care whether it's a junior, mid cap, or senior. When this uh, when this bull market and gold and silver is really allowed to fly, they're going to fly as well. Overall, are you bullish on gold and silver and gold and silver stocks this winter and spring? No, I think I just answered that question, yeah. and uh, I'm I'm bullish on everything precious metals related, particularly silver. My own stock portfolio is about. I would say between 85 and 90 percent in the silver stocks, and the rest are in gold. So I'm wildly bullish. I was wildly bullish last year, and the year before that, and the year before that. But as I keep pointing out, like a broken record here, is that until these eight large traders, most of which of them are bullion banks, and most of them are U.S. bullion banks, get off the price and let the precious metals fly, um, um, things are going to be muted, but uh, the signs are all there that this thing is is really going to sail, especially now that we have this uh, huge physical shortage in silver, which is only getting worse by the day. What's happening in physical versus paper, gold, and silver? Um, I think I've been talking about that all along here. You know, the paper market is wagging the physical market. You know, the, the, it's the paper market wagging the physical market, the physical market is totally controlled by the paper market and um, until that changes nothing changes it's showing signs that, like I said with the commitment of traders report uh, the big eight shorts have been hugely and I mean hugely reluctant to go back on the short side especially in silver but uh, right now it's still um, it's still the paper that's controlling the physical price it's uh, it's a 50-year price management scheme that's been going on ever since uh, Nixon took us off the gold exchange standard back in 1971, and I remember that day well. And uh, it's getting a little long in the tooth, and uh, all the signs are there that uh, it's uh, about to come to an end, an imminent end. And uh, I've been waiting for this for years, as of a lot of your listeners, and it seems like it's uh, almost upon us. Are gold and silver coins still selling for higher than usual premiums, and is this an indicator for the future prices of gold and silver bullion? Um, you know, I'll tell you what, up until about, say, the middle first part of December, the premiums were absolutely astronomical because, you know, the, the demand was huge and the supply is limited to what the sovereign and private mints can produce, and they were on back order for everything. You were lucky if you were able to get hand, your hands on any kind of physical metal, and if you could, you paid a huge premium for it. And this is particularly true of the American um, 
Silver Eagle, which uh, was selling for like more than a hundred percent premium over spot, and uh, that's backed off a bit. And uh, in the last month or so, you've certainly saw seen premiums on uh, precious metals fall, particularly silver. And uh, if you're ever going to be buying physical silver, I mean, uh, we're uh, the calm before the next round of shortages begins. If you're thinking of buying physical silver or physical gold right now, the premiums are pretty low. And uh, they been, haven't been this low for a year or two. So uh, this is the time to buy if you're ever going to do it. How's the gold-silver ratio looking? Well, now there's a real bugaboo. You know, I'll tell you something. Right now it's 80 to 1. Uh, I calculated it every day, and it was 80 to 1, yes, or 79.8 or something like that. Now, gold, silver comes out of the ground. There's 7 ounces of silver mined for every 1 ounce of gold. So that means on a physical basis, the ratio should be 7 to 1. So if you uh, do the math, that's about silver should be selling for about 11 times what it is right now. 11 times 24, whatever it is, newest dollars, what, 275 an ounce? In Canadian dollars, it would be over 400. Um, I don't think we'll ever see that, but, you know, 20 to 1 is certainly, uh, or less, say 15 to 1. You know, we're looking at the natural price for silver right now should be a very large three-digit number. And um, in a market-clearing event, it's going to become very high, but uh, sooner or later when this price management scheme does end, we're going to see a... um, a gold silver ratio in a small fraction of what it is today, and that will certainly be reflected in the price, uh, which will, like I said, be some rather impressive three-digit number before this is all said and done. And if you're a, a so-called regular person and you want to take advantage of, of your advice, how how do you do it? Do you go down to your local uh, gold and silver coin shop and stock up there? Or is there a way to find a affordable physical product? Well, sure. I mean, uh, if you live in a large city like Vancouver, Edmonton, Calgary, Toronto, wherever, in the U.S., Canada, or anywhere you live in the world, uh, any large city will have several bullion dealers. And uh, if you live in one of those cities, my urge is for you to uh, um, get to know your local coin store very, very well, and uh, they'll take very, very good care of you. And uh, that's what I urge people to do. But if you live in a smaller place where there isn't that sort of thing, then uh, you can buy uh, precious metals on the Internet, you know, within your own country that, you know, are very reasonably priced, and some of them include shipping. But um, that's that's the way to start. Uh, buy locally if you can, and if you can't, then uh, find a reputable bullion dealer online, and there are lots of them around. Ed, you say there's a physical shortage of silver. What signs do you see that indicate that? Well, it, it, it's mostly in the 1,000-ounce good delivery bar market. Uh, the shortage has been going on now for a couple of years. And it all started when uh, Wall Street silver showed up on the Internet back at the end of January of 2021. And since then, uh, the amount of silver good delivery bars in the COMEX has sunk well over 100 million ounces. The amount of silver disappearing out of the SLV ETF is just absolutely enormous. Uh, you're seeing drops in, huge drops in the LBMA silver inventories in London. Um, silver disappearing out of SIVR, uh, the ETF SIVR, ZKB, which is Zerka Cantonal Bank in Switzerland. The short position uh, in SLV is, I think it's around 46 million troy ounces right now. And the fact that there's even a short position that size in SLV means that the physical silver is just not there to be deposited. I mean, there's just, uh, like two and a half million ounces of silver disappeared out of the COMEX in the last two days. Uh, it's just disappearing hand over fist, and uh, sooner or later this is going to result in a shortfall. Somebody's not going to get their silver, and we're going to see a silver squeeze. But the amount of si- physical silver in the um, in the wholesale bullion market is just vanishing like uh, an ice cube on a hot day in, in Las Vegas. It is just disappearing and that's why i urge people you know if you haven't bought any or if you're thinking of buying more you know right now like the premiums are pretty uh pretty small the smallest they've been in a year or so and if you're going to buy some this is the time to do it because uh sooner or later this supply squeeze is going to hit the um the uh 
the end user, like the uh, Toyotas and the uh, Teslas and all these people are going, aren't just aren't going to be able to get it. And when we start running out of silver and that, at that level, then uh, there's nothing in the world that's going to stop the price from exploding to the upside. Ed, how can people find out more about and subscribe to your newsletter? Okay, well, I, you know, I've been publishing this thing now for, I don't know, 15 years. Started back in about 2007, working for Doug Casey. And now I'm on my own, and then just Google my name, Ed Steer Gold and Silver, and my website will pop up. And there's a tab there where you can look at a uh, a free sample copy of what I write. And uh, if you're interested in uh, the daily goings-on in the precious metals market, the, it costs the U.S. $100 per year, which is, at the current exchange rate is about, I don't know, $135 Canadian. Ed, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money. Entirely my pleasure, Jim. My guest has been Ed Steer, founder of EdSteerGoldAndSilver.com. He's also a director of GATA. He was speaking to us from beautiful Merritt, British Columbia. And that wraps up our show for this week. We'd like to thank our guests, Ross Clark, John Kaiser, and Ed Steer. And thank you for listening. If you have any questions for the show or for our guests, you can send them to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. We'll be back next week with more. This Week in Money. Comments made on This Week in Money are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. This Week in Money is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated. Executive producer is Tom Allen.